Hello, this is Mr. Catcher Side with um, RNSG 1341, Common Concepts of Adult Health. We're doing the review for our HESI final exam. First thing I want to talk about is testing anxiety and testing strategies. I've talked a lot about this during the semester, but I felt it would be helpful to get it through another person's eyes or another perspective. So I found some information from the Board of Certification for Emergency Nursing. This introductory video um, will kind of explain what's going on. It's only a couple of minutes long, but the article is very interesting. It's got lots of causes and uh, reasons you have testing anxiety, and then it goes down into the strategies you can do to overcome those. And there's several tabs you can um, click to get into the different aspects of testing anxiety and solutions. That's more in-depth than I could provide here. So I thought you would you would learn from that and I would encourage you to look into that. The next uh, thing here is testing strategies. Now this is different than test anxiety. This is how to interpret test questions, specifically those written for nursing students, um, to kind of help you decide um, what the best answer is. Um, it does, you know, it is going to rely on your knowledge base, but, you know, how do we apply critical thinking with that knowledge base to interpret the question so we can get the correct answer? So I'll have those links um, in the description in the box for YouTube, um, so you can click through those. I encourage you to look at those. So besides strategies and anxiety, what do we need to know to pass this test? Your overall knowledge base is going to have to be um, pretty well informed on each of these body systems. You're going to have to be able to derive from the objective and subjective data that your patient's giving you, whether that's from the interview, your history and assessment, um, plus any lab or imaging data that you can get to come up with a nursing diagnosis. Um, and from that diagnosis, planning your goals, what are things I can do right now to help my patient with this alteration or deficiency and whatever? Um, how's, how's that going to play in my goals? I've got to tailor the, those to the patient um, in order for the patient to be successful and to heal. And then, how do I intervene? How do, what are the nursing interventions I need to do based on those goals that I've pulled from the diagnosis that is informed by my assessment data? What do I need to do now for this patient? Um, what are the other healthcare team members supposed to be doing? Because remember, I'm a nurse, I'm the gatekeeper, I'm the patient advocate. I need to have some understanding of what the doctor's gonna order, whether it's diagnostics, or whether it's pharmacological interventions, or maybe the patient's going to surgery. These aren't things that I do. These aren't things that I can order. Um, but these are things that I would expect to happen so that I can be the patient's advocate and the overall gatekeeper for what's going on with the patient on my shift. Whether that's medical, surgical, pharmacological, or dietary. And then once I've done that, okay, the patient's had this disruption, they had this symptom that requires intervention, and either me or some other person on the team has intervened, has the, has the patient improved any? What is, what is my evaluation of the situation? Have the symptoms improved? And if so, um, or is my patient, can my patient verbalize understanding of the instructions? If it's something they need to do going forward in their life, can they teach me back? Can they teach back what they're supposed to be doing? There will be math. And these are going to be word problems. Um, not like your dimensional analysis math in your exams. This will be like um, mom went to the store with 75 cents um, and found apples on sale uh, for 10 cents a piece. It's going to be the kind of questions like that that we had in grade school, but it's going to be, you know, nurse goes into the room 
to administer 40 milligrams of Lasix um, from a vial that has 80 milligrams per cc, how many cc's or how many mls. That's, it's going to be like that. It's going to be dimensional analysis, but it's going to be uh, framed as a word problem. Your other, all your other um, questions um, are going to be what we call in education theory application or analysis and in nursing process we call interventions and evaluation. So everything's going to be you doing an intervention based on your assessment um, or your evaluation of an intervention. How, how do we know that what we did was successful? Um, and again, you're going to be determining the intervention based off your own objective or subjective assessment data, including but not limited to labs and imaging. Um, a lot of these are going to be, you know, again, nursing intervention evaluation, not only of nursing, but of other in interdisciplinary interventions, because you're the gatekeeper, you're the patient advocate. So that's why, why we're telling you to be aware of what medications the doctor should order what diagnostics the doctor should order, um, what lab values mean what, so you can call the doctor if they're off. Um, you have to be, even though these are things you can't order yourself as a nurse, you have to be aware of what the physician, what the dietitian, what the respiratory therapist, you need to be aware of what all they're doing to make sure it's appropriate for your patient. And then, of course, um, some of those questions are about the role of the nurse um, as an educator, as an advocate, as a preceptor for other nurses, and so forth. And um, I talked a little bit about this one already, determining if your intervention was successful, um, if the symptoms have subsided, if the teaching was successful, how do we know that? Whether we're doing a patient assessment or teach back for discharge teaching or observing one a new student that we have that we're precepting, how do we know um, that their work um, is correct? Also make sure, sometimes there's a question or two, we'll have a, a complaint or two every semester. Oh, Mr. Ketrasino, Dr. Bauer, um, we had this question about oncology medicine, and we don't do oncology medicine in common. That's correct. It's an unrelated question. But all of those have been reviewed by us, so if it does seem like it's irrelevant, look at the stem of the question. Nine times out of ten when you run across one of those, it's asking you to do something you already know how to do. If it's asking you to do a daily weight, that's going to be the same regardless of what kind of patient you have. If it's asking you to um, figure out a pharmacological dose, not any different in any other class you're going to take. So those any relevant, unrelated questions that are in the HESI have a relevant stem asking you to do a relevant intervention. So don't be thrown off by those. And um, there will be 75 questions, so about 50% more than what you're used to taking in a setting. Um, and it will be 102 minutes long. And as we're talking, uh, Dr. Bauer is setting up the information session um, so that you guys know what's going on and we should know when we're going to be doing this pretty soon. What do we need to know for fluid and electrolytes, our very first units? Fluid balance, fluid shifts, intracellular, extracellular, going back and forth. What does that mean? Why does things do that? Why does fluid go from one part of the body to the other? Is it following electrolytes? What are your electrolytes doing? What are your normal electrolyte values? What are the signs and symptoms of hypermagnesemia or hypocalcemia? You need to know all of those elements out of your syllabus and what the signs and symptoms are and the interventions um, for treating those imbalances. Acid-base imbalances, is this metabolic or respiratory acidosis or alkalosis? How do we know that? Do we remember our formulas for that so we can do that? 
I did make sure a lot of the acid-base questions that I cut out of the test were compensated or uncompensated. So you should only have acid-base questions that are identification or treatment related, but not compensation. IV replacement, so we've got a we've got a metabolic or a respiratory acidosis or alkalosis, and now we've got to give them some fluid to kind of correct the situation. What do we need? Does it need to be hypertonic or hypotonic? Does it need to be isotonic? What do those fluids look like? What are what are the names of those fluids? Blah blah blah. Genitourinary. This is a combo unit in the book. This is split up into from renal and reproductive. That's because we're not doing a lot in renal. But you do need to know about pyelonephritis, UTI, and incontinence. Know what the nursing interventions are, the um, reasons for those, why, why do they have one or the other, what causes one or the other. How do we treat those? Um, how do we diagnose those? Reproductive, we need to know the male and female reproductive disorders. These are usually not infectious related. They have to do usually with aging, um, genetics, or trauma. So what are these? What does it mean to have menopause or um, fibroids, uterine fibroids? What is BPH, benign prostatic hypertrophy? How do we treat those? What are the medications? The one thing on here you will need to know are the medications for BPH and for erectile dysfunction. And then on sexually transmitted diseases, there's that whole list of STDs. Um, in our syllabus, we need to remember those, what the treatments are. Remembering that this is one of those diseases that confers no immunity whatsoever. But it's also a disease that the doctor can write prescriptions for, not only for the patient, but also for the patient's sexual partners without actually assessing the patient. You need to know your antivirals. Um, specifically that, you know, they basically reduce the half-life. They don't ever cure the disease. And the viral uh, STDs are not curable, generally. Unit 3, immunity. This was a tough one. This slide here, this is things you have to... It's not necessarily things you're going to remember because there's not a artificial passive interaction that you do with a patient or an adaptive acquired, but these are concepts that you need to understand in order to do your interventions later on. Your interventions will be focused around hypersensitivities. What's type 1, type 2, type 3, type 4? What does it mean to have any of those? What are some examples of those? How do I treat those? Uh, what are the Immune dysfunctions, the primary and secondary dysfunctions, what does that mean? And what is acquired immunodeficiency syndrome and um, HIV from that? How, what's the prognosis? How does that go from point A to point B? What do we use to counteract that or to bring that under control? What are the labs we do uh, to discover if the patient has this or not? What's the confirmatory lab that we do? Um, these kind of questions are the ones you're going to need to know to be able to answer. And for immunity, you're also going to need to know the drug classes for all of those antibiotics, the anti-tuberculars and the antifungals. So make sure you're going back over those again, knowing what the actions are, the nursing implications, um, all that stuff we had to study for, for exam. Was that exam one or exam two? I can't remember. But you know, you know what we have to do with that because we had to study it before. Unit four, integumentary. Big thing on here is going to be psoriasis and pressure ulcers. You need to know the other stuff. I'm not going to say you don't need to know that. In fact, I, th I think I did see one fungal um, question in there. Um, but psoriasis is in there too, and pressure ulcers. How do we stage those pressure ulcers? What does that mean to be a stage three versus a stage four? And how do we treat that? Bacterial skin infections will be cellulitis or acne. How do we treat those? Um, what's the wound care going to be like on those? 
Unit 5, respiratory. Um, we've got pneumonia, TB, asthma, COPD, obstructive sleep apnea, and a little bit of respiratory pharmacology, most around inhalers um, and stuff like that. What do we use for asthma and COPD? Um, and then we, you know, moving from immune to respiratory, we have to know those respiratory um, drug or those 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 antibiotics or anti-tubercular drugs that we use for tuberculosis. There's one of those, but if you combine them, there's two that use different actions, and if you combine them, it really reduces the um, length of time the patient has to be on um, anti-tuberculars. Usually, usually that's six months, but that can be drastically reduced if we combine those tr two drugs. And what are those? What is pneumonia? What does that mean to have pneumonia? How is it different if it's viral or, anti or bacterial, and how do we treat that? One of our largest sections, Unit 6, um, the first part of that was nutrition. What's proper nutrition? Um, how many calories do we usually get? Um, what's BMI? What does that mean? What are our hospital diets and therapeutic diets? Um, how do those? How do we use those to treat the patient? Why do, why do we have to be on one or the other? How does culture impact any of those diets? Malnutrition, um, there's undernutrition, obviously, uh, micronutrient or like vitamin deficiency malnutrition, or the eating disorders. We're focusing specifically on obesity here. I think you cover the other ones in, in mental health, but obesity um, has a big deal here. Um, and, you know, they're usually, if, if, they're, if it's not responding to medications, or diet and exercise, and we do bariatric surgery. But what are the most common versions of those? Um, what are the complications of those? Um, and the big one usually is dumping syndrome. And how do we know it's dumping? What does that mean? How do we treat that? Diagnostics. Um, gastro has a lot of diagnostics. You need, you need to be able to know what all of these are. Be able to define all of these um, diagnostics. Here we have all the disorders of the esophagus and the stomach. For the esophagus, we have stomatitis and hiatal hernia and GERD. We know there are different reasons for having hiatal hernia versus GERD. What are those? What does that mean, GERD? What does hiatal hernia mean? What's the path on that? We do know that the symptomology and the, the effect that it creates in the body is identical. And so we have to treat those identically until we get into a surgical arena and those are differently treated that way, if it's bad enough. Go into the stomach, we see gastritis, which is kind of related to stomatitis. How are those different? Usually it's location. Um, that's the inflammation before we get into actual Peptic ulcers, which is the big one here, peptic ulcer disease. Um, is that, is that going to be duodenal? Is that going to be gastric? How do we tell the difference between the two? What's the bacteria that tends to be around uh, when you have peptic ulcer disease? We've got GI bleed up there. That's really a big complication of peptic ulcer disease. What's the other number one complication of peptic ulcer disease or some of these other um, gastrointestinal problems? have a board-like stomach or a rigid stomach, hard, rigid stomach. Perforation, spilling contents from the stomach or the intestines out into the peritoneum, causing massive inflammation and or infection, which can't be fought off with the body, right? There's no circulation there, the collateral circulation that's going to be absorbing this and getting rid of it. It's just there. It will kill your patient if it's not treated. Um, same thing with GI bleed. You can hemorrhage to death before you even know that um, there's a problem. How do we know how do we know the patient's got a GI bleed? What are the tests for that? How do we identify the cause or the location? Um, what are the, the scopes that we use to, to identify that? Um, and how do we tell um, the poop, basically? How can we look at poop and say this is an upper GI bleed or this is a lower GI bleed? 
foodborne illnesses. Um, the rest of these have a lot to do with foodborne illnesses or underprepared food. How do we treat that? So forth. Disruptions of the intestines. We have hemorrhoids, constipation, irritable bowel, fecal incontinence, and then acute inflammatory of the bowel, appendicitis, diverticulosis, diverticulitis, fistulas. Um, we know what hemorrhoids are, right? Um, how do we treat those? What's the reason for constipation? What's the preventative measure, the treatment? Um, to help prevent that and to get written to keep it from happening again once we disimpact the person. Appendicitis, um, what does that mean? How do we treat it? Um, that's usually surgically, right? I mean, we can start antibiotics before they go to surgery, but we're not going to cure them. The surgery is the only cure. Diverticulosis and diverticulitis, one is a condition, the other is a disease, which is which. And why do we have one or the other? And then the big thing for gastrointestinal is the pharmacology. The acid controlling drugs, which are the H2 receptor antagonist, proton pump inhibitors, both of these have different actions on the same controls for producing acid. So they really do act alike um, in the way they control the acid production in the stomach. And acids, on the other hand, are just like big sponges. They absorb and neutralize the acid that's in the stomach. They will also absorb and neutralize your other medications, so you really can't give an antacid with other medications at all. Um, for motility, our antidiarrheals, um, you know, got to stop, got to turn the faucet off or this patient's going to have so much fluid loss they'll go into um, renal failure and die. Um, but what's the one we can't put, we can't, you can't use antidiarrheals on? Clostridium difficile, because we've got to get that toxin out of the body. We're not going to be able to treat that until all the toxin's gone. So really, when you've got a patient like that and they're severely dehydrated, we're not only trying to get rid of the disease with um, antibiotics, antimicrobials, um, we're also having to treat the symptoms, which is dehydration, IV fluids. What are the anti-constipation drugs? Um, how we prevent that from happening? What is the what is the one drug of the, the laxative um, fiber group that's better than the others? What do we use the first one? Usually it's the natural. We use natural before synthetic, natural before chemical because um, that's usually a, cil a psyllium husk or some kind of grain husk based medication. And nausea and vomiting. The big thing on nausea and vomiting, you know, you got to watch for those things that are related to promethazine or are promethazine because that's a really toxic drug to be using for nausea and vomiting. Trade name Finnergan. Musculoskeletal disorders, um, not a ton of, on this. We do need to understand, though, the, um, the building and the tearing down. What's the osteoblast versus osteoclast? How do they, how do they work in healing bone fractures? Um, and how do they work in creating Paget's disease? Um, what are our fractures? What are the descriptions of our fractures? What's the difference between strains and sprains? What are strains and sprains? What's the, what's the mode of healing? What's that algorithm or that, um, the word that we use to treat, um, strains and sprains? What are meniscus injuries, uh, ligament injuries, carpal, carpal tunnel syndrome, compartment syndrome? We know that compartment syndrome is really going to be the major um, problem for um, things related to musculoskeletal, specifically if we had a fracture that ruptured blood vessels or created a lot of inflammation, this could cause the loss of circulation and limb death. Um, so it is an emergency. It's kind of the perforation of musculoskeletal, and we have to treat it seriously. 
total joints. Uh, I think I saw a total joint question in there, so be familiar with that as well. The other big large unit, cardiovascular, um, had just a few major disorders, hypertension, congestive heart failure, coronary artery disease, and vascular disorders. Hypertension is a major thing. It had a huge chapter on it. Um, we have to understand how that works, uh, what the, the new uh, parameters are for that, as we um, learned during the last test review. Um, most of our pharmacology is related to hypertension because it causes a lot of these other problems. There's two problems with the heart. One it has to do with blood pressure or conduction, which you'll learn about in the next the next um, semester or two, and then clogging them up with lipids, which is the coronary artery disease, which leads to arthrosclerosis, hyperlipidemia, and then the beginnings of, of angina. Hopefully that wouldn't pro progress beyond chronic stable angina. Um, what are the symptoms of that? Uh, what are the different kinds of that, especially the intermittent clotification? What does that mean? Claudication, um, how do we treat that? Vascular disorders, most of these are either peripheral or vascular. Um, there's some more specific. We learned about burgers and um, the other one. Those are all different kinds of uh, insufficiencies in the vascular system. What do those mean? What, does, what do those set you up for? Uh, the big dangerous one, obviously, is venous thrombosis. This is a DVT, a deep vein thrombosis. This can go into your brain and cause a stroke, or it can go into your lung and cause a pulmonary embolism. Pharmacology for cardiovascular. The big ones here are going to be um, your antihypertensives. Got to know your differences between beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, um, angiotensin II receptor blockers, calcium channel blockers, and diuretics. Um, ACEs and ARBs are going to be pretty much alike. Um, beta blockers are probably the most popular. They're certainly the most prolific um, kind. Calcium channel blockers, really, um, they have a lot of effect on the blood pressure, but they're they're not really a cardiac drug because they do so much so many other things. They're basically smooth muscle um, blockers, and then diuretics, knowing how those work, um, what which kinds protect the potassium, and which kinds um, just let it flow out. Um, Anti-lipidemics, I misspelled that again, gosh. Um, these are the statins. What do we use this for? What do we have to watch? What's the big nursing implication on statins? What do we have to watch for? What are we looking out for? Anticoagulants, need to know the difference between heparin, warfarin. Um, these are the major ones that we use. How do we use this for treatment and prevention of clots? Um, how are they different? What are the nursing implications on all of these? What are the, the new novel anticoagulants and why are, are those better or more dangerous than uh, some of the older ones? And now we're moving into the area that we just were studying this for this test, endocrine. Focusing on type 1 and type 2 diabetes, what do those mean? Um, what's the patho on those especially? What's the patho? What's the patho? What's the patho? What are the acute complications of diabetes? Um, three of the um, most important ones, hypoglycemia, um, HHS, hyperglycemic hyperosmolar syndrome, and diabetic ketoacidosis. Which ones happen most frequently with your type 1? Which happens most with the type 2? Knowing that with either one, these can be the person coming in the hospital discovers they have this. This is the reason they know they're diabetic. Um, and this is how they get diagnosed. Hopefully they don't die. Yes, you can 
die from DKA, um, even if that's your initial event of knowing that you're diabetic. What are the long-term complications of diabetes? There's lots. Um, some of these are microvascular, some are macrovascular. Um, there's a nephropathy, retinopathy, neuropathy. Um, what do all those mean? Um, what are the conditions those cause? What are the nursing implications around those? A lot of it's patient teaching, a lot of it's patient compliance. So how do we, how do we um, monitor that and make sure the patient knows what they're doing? The pharma, uh, anti, the pharmacology for diabetes. This is going to be your oral antihyperglycemics and your insulin. The most popular one is metformin for the orals. It's going to be basically the first drug they give you if they say that you're diabetic. Um, there is some patient teaching involved because obviously you can't take this and do a CAT scan with contrast. Um, and so there's some holes there. What's the time period and why? On your insulin, you're going to need to know the duration, the onset, um, all those factors. You need to know the difference between rapid, short, intermediate, and long, um, and why you would take different ones, and why, how are rapid and short alike, and how are they different. Neurosensory, focusing on brain disorders, spinal disorders, pain. Um, and so the brain disorders we're looking at are headaches. You've got to know the three different kind of headaches, cluster, um, migraine, and there's the other one that escapes me right now. But you've got to know all three kinds of headaches. You've got to know what causes them, how do you treat them, and how do you prevent them? And there's a good graph on the headache section that goes through all of that that you need to learn. A good table, I mean, that talks about preventative medication, treatment medication, and um, symptomology to help diagnose what kind of headache that they're having. Spinal disorders have to do with lower back pain and HNP. I think we may have covered this in musculoskeletal. Um, either way, you'll get it in either one of those units when you're studying for this. Um, let's see what else. Pain. Big thing on here is um, how do we monitor this without killing your patient? How do we, what are some goals we can set? How can we manage their pain effectively? Um, how do we allow them to um, treat their own pain with PCA and what's the patient education around that? Why is that such a, why are there so many controls around PCA with two nurses and a pharmacist usually checking it every so often and making sure things are locked up? Um, and then sensory ears and eyes uh, with visual disorders, glaucoma, cataracts, retinal detachment, macular degeneration. You're going to need to know the patho on all four of these. And with glaucoma and MAC degeneration, you've actually got more than one type. There's more than one type of glaucoma. There's more than one type of macular degeneration. You've got to know what those mean and how do we treat them differently. With ear disorders, uh, hearing loss, tinnitus, vertigo, Meniere's disease are going to be the major ones. Um, Meniere's disease is really a... Um, Umbrella for a patient that uh, umbrella term for the patient that has both tinnitus and vertigo um, and some other issues can be very it can be disabling um, actually. Um, so what does that mean? How do we treat that? How do we treat any of those? How do we know that the patient has it? What are the signs and symptoms of a patient having eye loss or sight loss and hearing loss? What do we do for those patients? How do we teach them? How do we make sure that they're safe? End of life. Um, what are all your legal documents? How do we, how do we um, do exactly what the patient wants us to do? Our default, like I talked a little bit about, 
in your exam 5 review, the default state is we keep everybody alive. We do everything we can to keep everybody alive. Put them on the monitor, do chest compressions, pump all these um, cardiovascular uh, acting drugs into their system to keep them alive. This letting people die business has really only happened in the last 30 years. Um, and it requires a lot of legal documentation. What is that legal documentation? Most of them fall under the um, umbrella of advanced directives. But what are the differences between an advanced directive and a living will? What's the difference between that and a do not resuscitate order? Um, what does the do not resuscitate mean? Um, there's some stuff in there about ethical ethics committees and um, ethical dilemmas. What are those? Um, what are some issues surrounding those? And when do we know when to stop doing things? What is palliative care versus hospice care? What are the dom domains? How do we take care of patients um, that are dying? There's so many aspects that we have to cover. We can't just throw them in a room and say, we're not going to do anything for you. We have to really take care of the whole body and the family. What are the signs and symptoms of someone that is dying, actively dying? Um, how do we manage all of that care? How do we take care of the family? What do we do once the patient has died? Um, how do we take care of the body? And how do we, when we're doing it, having a code situation and a patient does die, um, what are the differences in how we do all of this care uh, if someone was expected, if we knew they were on hospice or we knew they were a DNR and they died, how is that care different than the patient who had um, a hemorrhage after surgery and bled out and passed away? What are some things that we have to do that are different? What are the legal complications of that and how we manage all of that? So this was an overview um, of things that are going to be important, concepts that are going to be important on your test. Um, so make sure you study those. The big thing I would say, look at those things that I gave you at the first of this about test anxiety and about testing strategy. And also things that you're weak on, gosh, go back and go over that and, you know, look at those rationales, look at the pathos again. Try to find out why you didn't do well in those topics. And also just tear the heck out of those EAQs and NCLEX modules that you have from Elsevier. You need to be doing test questions out the wazoo. Um, we, we have done studies locally in our department, and we have seen a correlation between the number of practice test questions that one does and how well they do on the HESI. Remember, the HESI is going to be, you know, 75 questions. It's going to have two scores, the um, HESI score and the conversion score. The HESI score needs to be above 850 to prevent you from doing a lot of um, homework over the, the, the break. Um, but the conversion score is what goes in the gradebook, and those aren't necessarily related to each other. Um, so really try to do as good as you can. Try to knock this out of the ballpark. If you know what you're doing, if you know your material, there should not be a difference between your, your exam average um, and your HESI score. Where we have seen that, um, a drop between the HESI score and the exam averages on students that have really been squeak, you know, squeaking by and really don't have a good grasp on the material. So I'm getting this out to you a little early um, so that you guys can have this almost two weeks to... Look at your time available between now and then and get all the study studying in that you're able to do. Good luck and um, talk to you guys later. Shoot me an email if you have any questions.